A man by the name of Ruth Thant, this goes back uh, a while, back to the 60s, he was Secretary General of the United Nations. Most of us you know, really don't keep track of who the UN Secretary General is, but uh, Ruth Thant was Secretary General then, and he talked about this interesting concept called, the, called happiness and the pursuit of happiness, and he contended that happiness is not to be found in the pursuit of it. And this is something that's kind of interesting because it's written for us Americans, it's ingrained in us because it's written into our Constitution, and it's kind of that underlying assumption that you and I both have about life. I want to be happy and I expect to be happy, and he said that happiness was to be found not in the pursuit of happiness, but in pursuing physical, mental, moral, and spiritual perfection all at the same time. Piece of cake, right? But apparently he was talking about elevating ourselves to a higher plane. And placing these qualities in order, here's what he said, and I quote, I would attach greater importance to moral qualities or moral virtues over intellectual qualities and above all, I would attach the greatest importance to spiritual values, the purity of one's inner self, which to me is the greatest virtue of all." Unquote. We UCC people tend to place a premium on virtue. Virtue is when you know what is the right thing to do and then you actually go about doing it. That's something that we value a lot in our denomination. And we tend to actually value that more than what a person actually believes about God and about matters of faith. Now among UCC people, this plays out in a thousand different ways. The most common of those is social action. Uh, our members who go on short-term mission trips or who administer the Wax Fund, they are driven by a high sense of virtue. Virtue in our denomination is very much a verb. We are also a denomination that values restraint. We believe that the church is supposed to be a safe place and a welcoming place for everyone who comes here. The church is a place where people are supposed to be free from oppression, free from ridicule, where their personal and family boundaries are respected. Virtue in this sense means that we consciously avoid doing and saying certain things to one another. It is the virtue of restraint. Interestingly, for today, for this week, the Revised Common Lectionary takes this idea of faith that we see over here in Paul's letter to the Colossians and virtue that we see in Luke chapter 10 and tries to fuse them together. And so that's where I'm gonna to try to go with this, this, this marrying together of faith and virtue. It is the continuity of the inner life and the outer life together harmoniously and not in mutual exclusivity. First of all, you and I need to understand something that Christ profoundly changed everything. We need to see that we have a, actually a special place in the universe on account of Christ. That is to say that Christ takes us and gives us an entirely new status. Let's look quickly here at what Paul wrote to the Colossians. Paul says about Christ, he has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. The word here is rescue. God has literally rescued us, as it says here, from the power of darkness and has given us permanent membership in the kingdom of his beloved son, the kingdom of Christ. The next verse, verse 14, it says, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In Christ, our slate has been completely wiped clean. The atoning work of Jesus Christ upon the cross is what has taken away our sins. 1 John 2.2. 2. But the big question for us now is, what does a redeemed person look like? 
a redeemed person being someone who has had their sins forgiven by Christ. Should a person who has supposedly been rescued from the power of darkness and transferred in to the kingdom of Christ, should they somehow look different? And what I mean by that is, is should their personal behavior, their conduct, particularly towards their fellow human beings, reflect that? Should it reflect a heart that has been delivered from darkness? Should it show a higher sense of virtue than, say, someone who doesn't know Christ? For those of you who have ever had a philosophy course, you'll probably recognize the name Friedrich Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche was a German philosopher who has been quoted widely as saying, God is dead. Nietzsche was not very friendly towards religious faith, and he was particularly hostile to Christianity. I'm not really sure what drove his negative feelings towards Christians, but I suspect that it had something to do with the personal conduct of Christians themselves. I want to read for you something that Nietzsche said, and I quote, I might believe in the Redeemer if his followers looked more redeemed, unquote. Ouch. So what does a redeemed person look like? Well, the short answer, the Reader's Digest answer is, is they are a person who loves God and who cares for people. We'll look at the parable of the Good Samaritan. We're going to be jumping over to Luke 10 in a second. And Jesus told this story about a well-to-do guy who had asked him about how he might inherit eternal life. And, and Jesus said, well, you know, you read in the law. What does it say? And he says, well, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. We now pick up in verse 29 of Luke 10. And it says this. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? You know what he was doing? He was looking for a loophole. Jesus told him that he must love his neighbor every bit as much as he loves himself. But he would like to kind of pick and choose about who he's going to regard as his neighbor. And so that's what it says. He was trying to justify himself. And that's why Jesus told him the parable about the guy who got beaten up and robbed, his wallet stolen, and left lying there beside the road to bleed to death. Three different people, Jesus told him, come by and see that man lying there. And the first two who come along at different times, they completely ignore him, they pass by and continue on their merry way. But the third man who comes along has pity upon him and bandages his wounds and even gets him to an inn where he can rest and where he can be safe. Now that man happened to be from Samaria and there's a whole other there's a whole other sermon that can come out of that. We won't get to that today. But this is where the whole idea of the Good Samaritan comes from. This is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so Jesus goes for the punchline. He asks which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the man replies, he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, you got that right. Now go and do likewise. In other words, we're all neighbors with one another. And no, there are no loopholes. The Good Samaritan gave aid and comfort to a man who was a complete stranger to him. He didn't know the guy from Adam, but he did know that all human beings are created in the image of God. Our call as God's people, as God's people here at St. Paul, is to take the Good Samaritan story to heart and to go and do likewise. This is what people who have been rescued from the power of darkness actually do. When a person is truly in Christ, and when their heart has really been transformed by Jesus Christ, and they've really been pulled into the kingdom of Christ and out of the power of darkness, 
it will show in the way they regard their fellow human beings. Yesterday morning, I spent four hours over at the Palatine Police Headquarters. No, I was not in lockup, don't worry about that. <laughs> it was an anti-crime seminar for landlords, and during the presentation, the officer, uh, she showed us a news clip, a video news clip of an incident that took place, and it showed a 91-year-old man, a World War II veteran, a 91-year-old man receiving several punches to the head at the hands of a much younger man who was a carjacker. And the man beat him within an inch of his life and took the 91-year-old man's car. The most disturbing part of that was that standing not more than, not more than 10 or 15 feet away were four or five adult males physically capable of helping, but here they were, they were just bystanders, and they stood there and did nothing about it. They just watched. And the officer who presented this to us, she was clearly tipped. And the word that she described for their inertia was apathy. And I suppose that's one word, another word for me comes to mind. But either way, here were four or five able-bodied adult men who did absolutely nothing when that 91-year-old man was getting his head beat in. They refused to be a neighbor to that man. The people of God, and that includes us at St. Paul, we are called to look to the parable of the Good Samaritan, to his example, and we are to go and do likewise. And that plays out in over a thousand different ways. But we're to do it. It's what it means to love our neighbor. Amen.